We're hearing the term new normal a lot these days as people are trying to figure out what changes may be permanent. Will we shake hands again? Will we continue to wear masks? It had me thinking if a virus can impose permanent changes, how much more the saving work of Jesus Christ. We are to lay aside the old self, and as Paul says in Ephesians 4.24, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. The believer's new normal is filled with hope and eternal security. What a magnificent truth that is to consider. Please join with me in the singing of our first hymn. Praise the Lord, all nations, extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord, Psalm 117. Well, if you saw the note in the bulletin, uh, we've decided to postpone the reopening of the chapel. I think everyone can appreciate the reasons for doing this. So we will continue to meet as we're doing now in this way and provide updates when we have them. Speaking of updates, I tried to reach out to Jeff Brown to see if he had any new updates on family camp registration for this week, but all my correspondence was blocked for some reason. So it must be a technical difficulty that Jeff and I will have to work out. Well, there aren't many announcements this morning uh, I would remind you, if you have prayer requests or needs, to please uh, let those requests be known to the church office. We know uh, many are in difficulty and some are in poor health. And so the one thing we can continue to do to lift up one another is to uh, be praying for one another. So I would encourage everybody to continue in their prayer for the saints this week. As a reminder, we will observe the Lord's Supper following uh, Dan's lesson this morning. Well, we are glad that you are here with us on this Lord's Day, and now Dan will come up and read our scripture reading for this morning. Thank you, Seth, and good morning to all of you. We are studying the book of 2 Peter, and we've completed chapter 1. In fact, we began chapter 2 last week, looking at verses 1 through 3, and Peter's instruction about false teachers, the heresies they introduce, and the judgment that they will experience. He speaks of that in verse 3 and says uh, regarding this judgment that their destruction is not asleep. It's alert, as it were. Now he continues with an explanation for our passage, I should say, is chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority." May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together now in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank You for this time together. Even though we are scattered throughout the, the city and 
the, um, well, literally the metroplex and the state and maybe even beyond that. We uh, do thank you that in this way we can at least join together and we can have this time of study and then worship together. And so, Lord, we thank you for it. We need it. Your people survive, as it were, on the nourishment of your word. We must constantly be in it. And this is what you have uh, ordained that we do on the first day of the week on Sunday, which commemorates the resurrection. It's the time when we come together for study and worship. And so we pray you bless our time of study together in this text, which is a difficult text. It's not a pleasant passage to read. It's a passage about judgment, uh, about doom, but also about deliverance. And we have that in here as well. And so we are reminded as we study this that you are a God who's in absolute control. You're sovereign over the affairs of life. You have a plan and purpose for this world. You're working that out. And you deal with the ungodly and you deal with the godly. And we have an example of that that Peter explains for us in this text. Bless us as we consider it. May you be exalted. May we have properly the fear of God within us as a result of this time of study. And may it bring conviction where conviction needs to be brought and encouragement where it needs to be brought. So we pray your blessing upon us. Build us up in the faith. And we do pray for our, our circumstances in life today. They're, they're difficult. They're uncertain. And while it may seem like a trope to say it, while it's uncertain to us, it's not uncertain to you. You're on your throne. And nevertheless, that's true, and that's a very important fact for us to grasp and consider. But we pray, Lord, for our circumstances. I, I pray for the health of everyone in, in, in attendance at Believer's Chapel, every member of Believer's Chapel, but really for your people throughout the city and throughout the state and the country and across the globe. Bless your people. Protect them. And we think of ourselves, though, in particular, and I, I pray that you would bless those who uh, have potential difficulty. We do this every week, but we consider those who, whose immune system has been compromised, and I pray for them. Pray for Madeline Hargrove and Audrey Harrell, Margaret Smith, Betty Radford, just to name some. Lord, I, I thank you that, uh, that those... Individuals are doing well. Pray that you continue to protect them and give them continued recovery. But bless others, Lord, whose names aren't mentioned and perhaps are not, we're not aware of any difficult circumstances with them. But you know our needs. You know who uh, is facing surgery, perhaps, and, and difficulty. Bless them. Protect them. Protect all of us, Lord. And give us guidance and wisdom as this uh, country begins to open up and uh, people go back to work. I pray that you protect them. And I pray particularly for those who are employed today. I pray for their businesses. Some are business owners, uh, but others have, have jobs in companies that uh, are going through difficulties. I pray that you bless them, bless our members' jobs and businesses, protect them. See them through this difficulty. Give men wisdom, and may they see your hand of blessing. And may we come through this and be able to rejoice greatly. You're in control of all things, Lord. We know that. We're to rest in that. Help us to do that. Um, so, Lord, bless us and bless us as elders at this church as we consider when we're going to open up and how to do that and what's best. So, Lord, we look to you to bless us, bless our leaders, the uh, uh, president, vice president, uh, Congress, all of those around them, give them wisdom in making the decisions that will impact all of us at some point. Well, Lord, we, we do rejoice that regardless of the circumstances, you are on your throne. You are in control. We're reminded of that uh, through our text this morning. Bless us as we study it. We look to you to bless now. Pray these things 
In Christ's name, amen. The Lord told a story about a master who put his servant in charge of his estate, and he went on a long journey. While he was gone, the servant took advantage of his master's absence. He ate the master's food, got drunk on the master's wine, and beat the other servants. He lived for the moment. He lived as though there were no tomorrow. And then suddenly tomorrow came. The master returned, caught the bad servant in his wicked deeds, and put him in a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's people like that Peter described in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, false teachers who enter churches, introduce heresies, and live for their appetites. Sensual men whose judgment, Peter said, is not idle. In other words, it's coming. The false teachers didn't think so. For them, tomorrow never comes. And the Christians may have wondered if God would ever act. After all, these heretics were thriving. So Peter assures them, assures, assures everyone, God will act. He is patient with rebels but his patience should never be interpreted as indifference. Judgment will come. And Peter gives three historical examples to prove it. The first is the judgment on fallen angels. The next is the judgment on the fallen world. And third is judgment on the wicked cities. It's been said these Three, show the height, breadth, and depth of God's justice. It reaches as high as the angels, it is as wide as earth, and it goes as deep as Sodom. Yet in all of this, we also read of God preserving and delivering His people. There is a way of escape. There is mercy. It's a sobering text, a reminder that God is a consuming fire. But we should know that His great work is creation, not destruction, and more, salvation, not judgment. But judgment is the main subject. It is the warning of the passage, and Peter begins the alarm with the case of the fallen angels. Peter says that God did not spare them when they sinned. Now, he doesn't tell us when they sinned. And so we might naturally think that it was when Satan fell. In Revelation 12, verses 3 through 9, John describes war in heaven in which Michael prevails over the dragon and casts him out of heaven. And he says his tail swept away a third of the stars, meaning he took with him Angels. Some have interpreted that uh, of Lucifer's fall in the beginning. It's not. Revelation 12 is about a future event that marks the beginning of the end for Satan. But it does indicate that the devil had a host of angels join him in his re original revolt and who fell when he fell, and have been in league with him ever since. They are the demons. And they are presently at work to frustrate God's purpose and attack his people. They are very much active today. Paul tells us that in Ephesians chapter 6, which is proof that Peter is referring to something else. Those angels, those demons, are, are presently working in the world. But what Peter is describing is a group that are in a kind of uh, jail, not the world. He writes that God cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And so they're in that place. They are reserved somewhere 
for judgment. So this is referring to a different rebellion. And since Peter, in the other examples in our passage, is drawing on the book of Genesis, that probably is where we are to find this event, and most likely in Genesis chapter 6. That's where Moses describes events that led to the flood, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. I'll read the text. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Well, this is a controversial passage, but I think the sons of God is a reference to angels. Uh, the phrase is used elsewhere in the Old Testament only in the book of Job. I think it's used there three times, and it's always used of angels. So Moses is describing angels in some way cohabiting with women. We're not told how it happened, but in doing it, they crossed a line. They sinned. It's a, a strange text, an unusual interpretation, I know, so we want some support for it if that's going to be what we take as the meaning of Peter's statement here. And we have that in other passages, Jude, uh, Jude 6 and 7 parallel what Peter says here. Jude writes of angels who abandoned their proper abode, then comparing the angel's sin to the Sodomites says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality. In other words, the angels and the men of Sodom indulged in the same kind of sin, immorality, which fits Second Peter, because the false teachers were sensualists, they were immoral men. In fact, that is an emphasis here. This is how they are described in verse 2. Many will follow their sensuality. And then again in verse 10, those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires. It's clear from the context that that is the link between the sin of the angels and the sin of the false teachers and the cause of judgment. Also, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, in that text we're told that after the resurrection, the Lord made proclamation to the spirits now in prison who were disobedient in the days of Noah. The expression spirits without a qualifier as in spirit, uh, spirits of men. So just the word spirits never refers to men. So there in 1 Peter 3 also, Peter is speaking of angels who sinned in the days of Noah. We're not told how this angelic invasion and sin might have occurred if it was by uh, possession of, of men uh, uh, or is, if it was a, some kind of an incarnation. Uh, we do read of angels taking bodily form in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 18, for example, Abraham is sitting in the opening of his tent and he looks up and there are three Men, that's how they are identified, standing before him. But we know one of them is the Lord, a pre-incarnate appearance of him, and the other two are angels that would later go on to Sodom and res rescue Lot. But there Abraham prepares a meal for them, and they have that meal. So they are ange angelic individuals. One is the Lord, two are angels who have bodily form and are able to take in food and nourishment. So that would lend support to that kind of thing happening. 
however it happened. And the Bible doesn't always give us the details that we want. However it happened, it did happen. And the outcome of their disobedience is given. God cast them into hell. Now that's an unusual expression, cast into hell, because it occurs only once in the Bible. That's here. And the word translated hell is, is an unusual word for the New Testament, not, not for Greek literature, but it's the word Tartarus, which is found in ancient Greek literature. Tartarus was the place of punishment for the wicked departed spirits. This may be what the legion of demons was afraid of in Matthew chapter 8. You remember in that chapter... Jesus and his disciples cross over the Sea of Galilee to the region known as the Gerizines or the Gadarenes. And there, the, no sooner do they reach the shore, and this man, a wild individual, comes out at them. He's a violent individual. He dwells among the tombs, and he's possessed of a demon, but not just one, a whole legion of demon, which, demons, which means thousands. And they asked Jesus if he had come to torment them before the time. They, they may have feared being cast out of the man and into the abyss. It's where the rebellious angels are presently kept in prison until the final judgment. Now, if God judged the angels... He will certainly judge men, the false teachers, who are lower than the angels. That's the, the point that Peter is making in all of this. The certainty of the judgment of these false teachers. So we would expect him to say that. But before he does, he thinks of another example to add to it. The flood, which was to some degree precipitated by this angelic invasion, verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. The striking thing about this is the contrast between the vast numbers that, that perished in the flood and the small number that were saved. It is as if Peter were saying, if, if he, if God, did not spare the entire world due to their sin, will he spare the false teachers for theirs? Certainly not. What was the sin that brought judgment on the ancient world? Well, according to Genesis 6, 5, men were severely and universally corrupt. Moses wrote that every intent of the thoughts of his, meaning man's heart, was only evil continually. They were sensual men. They were violent men who had totally rejected the truth of God, not unlike the false teachers of Peter's day. And because of that, God destroyed the world in justice, in righteousness. But out of that mass of doomed humanity, God did display his mercy and grace. He preserved Noah with seven others, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Noah is described here as a preacher of righteousness. We're not told where and when or precisely what he preached, but you can imagine how this might have happened and, and what he would have said during the many years he and his sons were building the ark. People would have, have noticed this. They would have probably walked by the construction site and they would have wondered naturally what was going on and would have asked him about that and he would have explained it. Judgment is coming. And, and we do have a sermon from that age. Enoch, who preceded Noah, was a preacher of righteousness. Jude tells us what he preached in Jude 14 and 15. Enoch preached that the Lord is coming with his holy ones, with his angels. And he will come to execute judgment upon all 
and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way and have spoken against him, spoken against the Lord. He, he preached to the, the, the men of his day against their sin and about the consequences of that sin, about eternal damnation. It's never been a popular sermon for a preacher to preach, and it wasn't popular then any more than it is today. But that is patriarchal preaching, and that is apostolic preaching. Paul did that. Luke writes in Acts 24 that he, he spoke to the Roman governor Felix about faith in Jesus Christ, about the need for it. He writes in verse 25, he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And Luke added, Felix became frightened. The King James Version has, Felix trembled, but he didn't believe. I suppose there were many in Noah's day who heard him preach about righteousness, and they too trembled, but they didn't believe. We can't make that happen. We can't make people believe, but we can be witnesses. And that's what God requires of us. That's really all that he requires of us, to be faithful witnesses in this world. And this must have encouraged those to whom Peter wrote, at least the faithful ones to whom he wrote. They had a hard audience. They had a hard life to live the life they were living, a life of righteousness, and to preach it. That was difficult. Pagans rejected them. And they had these false teachers contradicting them. They might have wanted, may have wanted to quit. Noah didn't quit. He continued to be faithful. He preached and he built until the day that God told him to enter the ark. When he did, the Lord shut the door. And when he shut that door, it was all over for the ancient world. We're to do the same. It's easy to get discouraged, but we're to continue to give the truth regardless of man's response. We're to continue to, to live a life of obedience and one that brings glory to God and reflects the kind of people that he's made us to be, new creatures in Christ. We're to be a witness and we are to work as unto the Lord until the work ends. This, this does remind us, while the subject is judgment, it reminds us of God's grace. All during this time, he had a witness. Those who perished in the flood could not say they'd never been warned. They heard. They had opportunity. And that was also... Uh, true in the most notorious cities of the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah. Peter's next example of judgment. In verse 6, Peter goes from water to fire, fire and brimstone. We read in verse 6, And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. If he did that, Peter is saying, then of course he'll do that with these false teachers. Peter's description of the event is graphic, reducing them to ashes. The same expression was used by the Roman historian Dio Cassius of Pompeii when Vesuvius erupted and covered it with ash. Some of you will uh, remember the eruption of Mount St. Helens in uh, 1980 and the vast destruction it caused, how the, the force of it flattened whole forests like matchsticks. That was the force that destroyed the cities of the plain. The intensity of God's wrath is indicated in the, the Greek word that Peter used and is translated destruction. 
It's the word catastrophe. We get our word in English, catastrophe, from it. The word that he used for the flood in verse 5, cataclysmos, is the word. We get our word cataclysm from it. Now, those English words don't define the Greek words, but what those English words show is how violent that those Greek words were, how, how, how expressive they are of the power of God. Now, God is long-suffering. He's patient with this world. But when His wrath comes, and it does come, that's Peter's point, when it does, it is devastating. It brings about complete ruin. The, the purpose of this, though, was it was not only to wipe out a wicked city, but to make an example of it, of all those cities. That's what Peter says, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives. So there's a bit of grace in that. Here's the example of what's coming. Here's the warning. And, and the, the story is an example to us, but also the place where this event occurred is an example. The cities were located in the Jordan Valley where the Dead Sea is now. Then, in Abraham's day, it was um, lush, green, a beautiful valley. Now it's a barren waste. It's a desert. That's what sin produces. That is the end. The false teachers won't escape. That's the warning. But there's also uh, an encouragement here. Out of the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was rescued. God is just. He is just, but He's also merciful. Verse 7, And if He rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what He saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt His righteous soul tormented, day after day, by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Now that's instructive. And what I mean by that is we're not surprised that Noah would be called a preacher of righteousness. But it is surprising that Lot would be called righteous. In fact, that word is used repeatedly of him in this passage. We find very little righteousness in the account of Lot. In fact, his story is all sad. He was a man who lived by his wits and for his ambition. When he and Abraham made their... Uh, separated from one another. You remember Abraham recognized there's conflict between your herdsmen and mine. This area is not wide enough for us. So we need to separate and I'll let you choose. It was a gracious act on his part. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. But he let Lot make the choice and Lot chose the lush green valley where those cities were located. It is described in um, Genesis 13, verse 11, this Jordan Valley as being like the Garden of the Lord, like the Garden of Eden. It was a Highland Park. It was where everybody wants to live, where the lawns are lush and the houses are big. Financially, it was a smart choice for a lot, but spiritually... It was catastrophic. He, he made the decision without any regard for Abraham, without any regard for the Lord, without any regard really for his soul. It was all for self. He lifted up his eyes, Moses said, and he saw the valley. Now that is the story right there. He lived by sight, not by faith. That's always disastrous. He got what he wanted. 
Genesis 19, when the angels come to warn him of the judgment, they found him sitting in the gate. He wasn't there with the welcoming committee or the hospitality committee. Sitting in the gate showed that he was a a man of prominence. That's where the, the judges sat. That's where court was held. So Lot at this point has a position of prominence in the city of Sodom. So evidently he he flourished there and became a leading citizen, but at a cost through compromise. His witness was affected so that he was no preacher of righteousness. In fact, when he tried to preach, when, when he told his sons-in-law that judgment was about to come, it was imminent, it was about to fall on the city, they need to flee, they thought he was joking. In fact, I can just imagine the, 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 the more intense he got and the more he pressed them, the funnier they, he looked to them. They couldn't take him seriously about spiritual things. Through years of conformity, he had lost any influence he might have had for good. Even when it came time time to leave the city, he hesitated. The angel had to seize his hand and, and force him to leave. And even when he, he is out and he is safe, the last scene of Lot's life is uh, truly pathetic. It's one of drunkenness and incest. It's been said, they got Lot out of Sodom, but not Sodom out of Lot. Yet, Peter calls him righteous Lot. How is he righteous? Not morally, but forensically, meaning judicially. He was justified, just as Abraham was by faith. He came out of Ur when Abraham did. He believed what Abraham believed. Justification is all about imputed righteousness, not infused righteousness. It's not about being made good. That's sanctification, not justification. Justification is about being declared righteous. It's about the status of righteousness that we have before God. It is about being accepted with God. That's his verdict on us as believers. As judge, he declares us innocent of the broken law. And not just innocent, but righteous as having kept the law fully. And he makes this declaration on us because of what Christ did in our place. And it's received through faith alone. Paul speaks of it in Romans chapter 4, verse 5, when he says that God justifies the ungodly. He doesn't justify those who are improving or, or trying or the morally pure, but those who believe. They have new status. It's what Paul describes in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9 about not having a righteousness of his own from the law, which is impossible, the law was not given to make us righteous. It was given to expose our lack of righteousness, our sin. But righteousness that he has, that Paul has, is the righteousness that comes from God through faith in Christ. Through faith, we join ourselves to Christ. We join ourselves to his life and his death, to his ministry. And in so doing, we receive from the Lord God, the gift of His righteousness. It's based on what Christ did, not on what we do. Now that's what happened a lot. And that's why He's described as righteous. He was forgiven. He had the imputed righteousness that comes through faith. And there is evidence of His saving faith. He overcame His hesitation and He did flee the city, without looking back, as he had been instructed not to look back. And while he was in the city, Peter describes the, the circumstances of his life. How It, it, it troubled him by the, the sin that he saw. He felt his righteous soul tormented 
day after day by their lawless deeds. So we can't always see the fruit that must be in the redeemed person's life. Sometimes it's there and we don't see it. Uh, Christians can be carnal. The Corinthians were that. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. He begins the book in chapter 1 verse 2 by addressing them as saints, and then in chapter 3 calls them carnal. Uh, They behaved, he said, as men of flesh. Christians can, saints can be worldly, they can be fleshly, they can be fools. We're all in danger of becoming that, of being that. Uh, Because the justified saint, as the reformers used to say, are righteous sinners. Justified, declared righteous, but still we have that law of sin within us, as Paul puts it. We still struggle, the flesh and the spirit, and that will be the case to the day we die and to the day we go to be with the Lord. So saved people fall into sin and worldliness. Now, that's not an option for us. It's not an alternate life to choose as a Christian. Living like Lot is not living the Christian life. And it brings discipline. It's not the Christian life to live like Lot. Lot, And why would we want to? He was miserable and he he lost everything. But he is a proof of God's grace which is unconditional. And God delivered him. That's the point that Peter is making here in verse 9. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. That's His great work. The Lord knows how to save His people. After all, if He could save Lot, who wasn't all that sure He wanted to be saved, then He certainly can save you. And He will. The rescue here is from the temptation in verse 9, or test, it's singular. And the great temptation here is the, in this context is to fall into unbelief and judgment. The Lord won't let that happen. He delivered Noah and He delivered Lot from that. They lived among mockers and unbelievers, but the Lord delivered them from the flood and the fire, and He will deliver us. He will preserve us. So we should never despair. The Lord won't lose one of His people. He knows how to rescue us out of the great temptations, out of the great tests, so that we can certainly, um, so that He can certainly rescue us from the lesser ones as well. Conversely, he knows how to judge the ungodly, to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and he will. Those who have rejected Christ and uh, died in their sins are presently being punished, while at the same time they are, are being preserved, they are being kept for the great day of judgment in the future, the lake of fire. Peter adds in verse 10 that this has particular reference to those who indulge the flesh. And that brings things full circle back to the false teachers. God will punish with special severity those guilty of immorality, and especially those false teachers who eat the sheep, the shepherds who don't shepherd them but destroy them who use their respected position to prey upon the naive and the unsuspecting. Peter said their judgment is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. And he's given three examples from history to prove it. That's a warning for the false teachers. As as Jesus said in his parable, "The, the master will come when the wicked servant isn't expecting him And he may meet his judge 
either in death or at the Lord's return, but it will happen. But this also is for us, if we have ever been troubled as Asaph was in Psalm 73 with the prosperity of the wicked and wondered why God allows it. Well, he won't allow it for long. And God is able to end the reign of the wicked and will someday do it finally and completely because he is sovereign. He rules this universe and he rules this world. He rules time and events. That too is is one of the lessons of this passage. And it is for... It it is the reason for complete confidence in the Lord to do what he has promised to do, judge the wicked. He's sovereign over all of life. And because he is, he can and will deliver us. He knows how. That's what Peter tells us. Paul experienced that many times in his life. God's rescue. There are numerous examples that we can give, but one that comes to my mind is in Acts 23 because it's an unusual moment of deliverance and it's one of amazing providence. He was delivered from assassination in Jerusalem when his nephew overheard the plot of some Jewish zealots, told the Roman commander who quickly ordered horsemen to take Paul to safety in Caesarea. Very interesting. Paul could do nothing for himself. He didn't even know about this, uh, this scheme to take his life. He was uh, under uh, Roman guard. He'd been arrested. But somehow, his nephew of all people overheard this plot, this scheme. Was he walking under the window when he heard it? Somehow it became known to him, of all people in Jerusalem... And he made it known to the Roman commander, and Paul was rescued. Nothing is hidden from the Lord. He can deliver us from harm. He can deliver us from temptation. He can deliver us from sin and a failure of faith. He can make us to stand in any situation. He is sovereign over all circumstances. So we are to trust him. He's all wise and all powerful and completely reliable. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. To not do that in this world that is condemned and doomed is insanity. Lot did, weak as his faith was, he listened to the angels, fled the city of destruction, and was delivered from it. But the basic lesson from Lot is God delivers the righteous. And a person becomes righteous through faith. The faith of Abraham, the faith that he had in the simple gospel of salvation through the Redeemer. Noah preached righteousness to his generation. No one listened. No one believed and no one survived, but Noah and seven souls, the seven ones, the eight that God put into the ark. Judgment's coming. Peter assures us of that. The Lord told the story in his parable, it will come unexpectedly when the unbeliever isn't ready, isn't looking for it, isn't expecting it. That's the lesson of the Bible and the lesson of history. And those who who won't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. If you're here or you're watching without Christ, don't fall victim to that, to ignoring the message of Peter and the Bible. Don't be like the men of Noah's day and scoff. Judgment is coming. It is eternal. Don't ignore the warning. It can come at any moment. It can come in the next hour. It can come in the night. 
at the time you aren't expecting. You may be taken out of this world in a moment. As the psalmist said, today if you hear His voice. Today if you hear His voice. Do not harden your hearts. Believe. Trust in Christ. He receives all who do at that moment. Be saved. Be counted by God as righteous and acceptable to Him. May God help you to do that. I'm going to close in prayer and then we'll have a hymn and then we will all join together in taking the Lord's Supper. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, thank You for Your goodness to us. and Thank You for the revelation here that Peter gives us. It's, uh, it's disturbing. It should be. It's sobering. Help us to learn the lessons of it. And, and the lesson that, we, that should stand out for us as your people, as believers in Jesus Christ, is you rescue us. We have been delivered from wrath to come by your son's death, your grace, and your mercy. You chose us, you purchased us, you called us out of this world. We give you praise and thanks for that. Bless us as we now turn our attention to remembering your Son and remembering your grace and all that we have in Him. We thank you for this time together in Christ's name. Amen. We're living in a unique time. What we have been experiencing will literally be one for the history books as this global pandemic has altered the way we live and brought death and financial distress upon so many in such an exceptional measure. Against that backdrop, though, there have been moments of relief, as we've seen on the news, images of individuals emerging out of great sickness and peril to health and reunion with loved ones. I saw one uh, on the news on Friday, a, a health worker who had gotten severely ill and quarantined for quite a period of time, but who had regained her health. And the image was of her seeing and embracing her son for the first time in weeks. And then I read the passage in Second Peter that Dan has just brought before us and was struck by the beautiful verbs in it. Rescued, preserved, and most of all, those words in verse 9, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly. The human soul longs for rescue. And the Lord's Supper is in miniature, an enduring parable presenting the Lord God as a rescuer. In it, we see him as the preserver and savior of those that he has loved and chosen to bring into his family uh, to be his children, his adopted family. The Bible, of course, portrays him in that way from beginning to end. In Eden, we find him slaying animals in order that he might clothe and cover the sin of his fallen creatures so they may have their fellowship restored. On Mount Moriah, as Abraham, at God's command, drew back his sword to slay his only son as a sacrifice. God stays his hand at just the right moment and provides a ram in the thicket as a substitute. In Egypt, on the occasion of the first Passover, uh, the Lord instructed his people, you know this story, to kill a lamb and, and to put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and the lintel of their home so that that evening when the destroyer came, uh, to slay the firstborn in every home. Uh, the Lord would hover over the homes that had the blood and, and prevent any death from entering there. And we could go on. Uh, the Lord is a rescuer. Dan's made the point uh, this morning. Uh, for centuries, the sacrificial system of the Mosaic law pointed to deliverance from the consequences of th sin through the shedding of the blood of a substitute, but all along those sacrifices were pointing to a future day uh, when John the Baptist 
would point to the God-man, Jesus, and say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was the ultimate rescue, and it could only have been realized in a Savior, Jesus Christ. The very idea of rescue, of salvation, of deliverance, is bound up in that tiny little word in the formula Jesus used in the Lord's Supper, for. Uh, This is my body given for you. Uh, This is the blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. His body on our behalf, his blood to rescue us. What a blessing uh, to have a Savior. Uh, We've heard it in the sermon, and as we do this now, we are reminded what a blessing to have a Savior. We celebrate that now again this morning in our own observance of this supper that he has left for us in order that we might not grow complacent or distracted by life's tedium or the world's allurements or the fears that many of us have. Instead, we do this in remembrance of him, and we are reminded that we are safe in our Savior. And we invite all who are listening this morning who have yourself been rescued by him to participate with us. This bread and this wine, uh, these simple elements the Lord Jesus used when he established the supper, the bread, um, a symbol of the life that he poured out, his body, Uh, He took the bread on the evening he was betrayed. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body given for you. The wine representing the blood that he shed, inaugurating a new covenant and the promise of the forgiveness of sins and life eternal. So if you've been rescued by him, we invite you to participate with us in the Lord's Supper, in your home, wherever you may be. Let me give thanks for the bread. Father, we do thank you for this message from the Apostle Peter uh, that reminds us of of the very important uh, aspect of the reality of our lives, that you are a holy and righteous judge. Uh, But for those who you have set your special love upon, you are our Savior, you are our friend, our rescuer. And we thank you for the divine plan in which you sent your Son, uh, God, very God of God, a very God, uh, a real man who took our sins upon himself as our substitute. And this bread reminds us now of that. Bless us so that we might remember him in a way worthy of that sacrifice. In his name, amen. I want to continue with that theme of rescue. I'm going to read from Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Zechariah comes right after Malachi, Malachi right after Matthew. I know you know that, but Zechariah chapter 3. Then I then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed clothed with filthy garments, standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. There's a famous story connected with this, that when John Wesley was a boy, the family house caught on fire. 
Through some difficulty, everyone escaped, only to realize that young John was still in the house. When he appeared in a second-story window and cried out to them, they were able to climb up to the window and pull him out just before the roof fell into the room. They called him a brand plucked from the burning, and they saw it as a sign that he should offer others salvation from even fiercer flames. That's what we are who have believed in Christ. Brands plucked from the fire. And who plucked us from those fiercer flames? Jesus Christ. He did it by the cross, by the payment that He made for us and our sins. It was an effective purchase. That's what Jesus said it would be. He said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to Myself. John chapter 12, verse 32. All kinds of men. People from every walk of life, from every generation, vast multitudes of them would be drawn to Him. But the Lord's sacrifice not only delivered us from eternal judgment, which we deserve, as Satan, the accuser of the brethren, reminds the Lord, and he's right. Nevertheless, we've been delivered from that, and we have been made worthy of the eternal life that we possess. He took away our sins, just as the Lord took away Joshua's filthy clothes, and replaced those sins with His own righteousness, so that when God the Father sees us, He sees us through the white garments of Christ's righteousness. He's done it all for us. I'm struck by the passivity here of Joshua, the high priest. He doesn't say, clean me up. He doesn't say, where are some garments that I can have. He doesn't argue with Satan. He does nothing but accepts the, the accusations against him, and then the Lord does everything. And that's what He's done for us. We are as, as pure in His sight from head to toe, from, from the, the clean turban to the hem of our festal robes, as Joshua the high priest was. Only in a greater way, spiritually. And since we are dressed in festal robes, we ought to be joyful people. We ought to be people that rejoice in our salvation, and in rejoicing in our salvation, we should be rejoicing in the Savior, in God our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who obtained it all for us. We are debtors to mercy alone. But we remember Him in this hour, and we remember the blood that He shed for us. It's symbolized in the the cup that we will now take. So let's give thanks for the Lord's death and the salvation we have received from Him. Father, thank You for that sacrifice. We thank You, Father, for this cup that reminds us of the blood that He shed. And we have to confess We must confess, we should confess that we did nothing to deserve it. And we did nothing in in taking upon ourselves the righteousness with which you've clothed us. You took away our sins. You gave us righteousness. We are dressed in festal robes, as it were. Even the faith that we have that seized hold of Christ is a gift from you. Thank you for all that we have in Christ. Thank you for his death for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. That concludes our service for this week. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for bringing us together this Sunday morning and for the time we've had to study together and worship together and reflect upon who you are, your greatness, your absolute sovereignty, your righteousness, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you that in your love for us, which is unexplicable, you sent your son to die for us. We thank you for him. And now, 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen. Have a healthy week and Lord willing, we will be back next week.